Thank you, Danny. We'll be looking today at Job's third friend, Zophar. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, his three friends, came to see him after terrible tragedy hit him. Job doesn't know why. Uh, I have found that God is not, that it's not important to God. Not to say he's not interested in it, and I almost said that. Maybe that's what I was thinking. God is interested in our wives, but they're not as important as than the other things. As a matter of fact, later on in the story of Job, in the book of Job, God is actually going to come and speak out of a whirlwind, out of a tornado. And he's never going to explain the whole thing. He's never going to answer all of Job's questions or Job's accusations. I'm finding that my questions have dwindled away the longer I've lived and the longer I've served the Lord and a lot of my accusations and a lot of my anger toward the Lord. Job is very angry at God. The Bible, the New Testament talks about having the patience of Job, but it means endurance and it doesn't mean he kept his cool. It doesn't mean that he didn't toe the line sometimes, get very close to the situation, to the perhaps the possibility of Speaking ill about God in ways that had no respect in them and no reverence at all. But he was just pouring out a heart of pain. And, uh, God is going to, to answer. But uh, I find that after over 50 years of walking in His grace, that He has taught me some things and I've learned some things. And I, I learned that I am, I'm having fewer and fewer questions. Not... Uh, because they've been answered and I've checked them off. It's just that they just, I, I think that they're beginning to matter to me just as much as they matter to him. Uh, let's look at this. Let's go on. We're going to look at Zophar, the Naamathite, and uh, we're going to describe him as an angry friend. An angry friend. As human beings, bad things are going to happen to us. Good things are going to happen to us. It is a hallmark of Eastern religion, many of the Eastern far Eastern religions, the concept of yin and yang. And what that means is, is that there's a lot of light in the world and there's a lot of darkness. There's just as much light as there is darkness. Just as much good as there is evil. And there's a little bit of good, a little bit of evil in every good thing, and there's a little bit of good in every evil thing. It's a balance. That's not true at all. I, I totally reject that philosophy. That seems to permeate many Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Sikhism, so forth. There's so much God. It's, it, there's not a dualistic battle between God and the devil. God's not fighting the devil. The devil's so far away down here. He's not a, an equal with God and they're going face to face or toe to toe. The devil is like a fly or a gnat to God. It, the devil is done. He's even told us. He said that the devil is done. When Jesus sent out the 72 there in the Gospel of Luke and they came back reporting what they'd done but just preaching in Jesus' name, Jesus told those 72 disciples. He says, when you were out preaching, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. In John's Gospel, chapter 16, Jesus said to his disciples, now is the prince of this world cast out. He's toast. He's done. And the New Testament tells us that all you and I have to do, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You don't have to wrestle with the devil. You don't have to wrestle with temptation and fight. I know you've heard me use this illustration. This is the way it is. If we could uh, take plastic or sheets or whatever, we take black paper and just black out every ray of sunlight in the sanctuary and turn out all the lights. 
If we could just shut all the doors and the windows and just close everything out and just make it dark here. Just dark so that you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. So dark. That's the way darkness is. Heavy, thick. But then I'd say, okay, I would have someone stationed at the lights. Turn on the lights. And when the lights came up, there wouldn't be any battle between light and darkness. And then, you know, the, the darkness coming and the light attacking it. No. When you turn on the light, the darkness flees. It's gone. It instantaneously disappears. There's so much more good in the world, so much more God in the world. Now, you can listen to all your social media, and you can listen, you know, I, I think there's a good chance you, you probably ought to just turn your television and your radio off and burn the newspaper. All they want to talk about is how awful and how terrible and how bad everything is. Yes, if there's trouble in the world, there's difficulty, always has been, always will be. But the amount of good in the world so far surpasses that which is evil. If you can't see that, then you've been blinded. There's much more of God in the world than there is of the godlessness. You may feel like the world is going to hell in a handbasket when it is not. Everything is going according to the plan of God perfectly. As I travel, I hope the same is true for you. You can, and I can learn to trust God more and more. And not to believe everything I hear and see, and not to believe all of Satan's lies. Because that's really all he can do now. Just lie. He can't make me do anything. He can't have power over me. And if I just simply resist him, he has to flee. Job is being victorious, but he has many complaints. He has a lot of hard and harsh words. We've looked at uh, Job made a speech, and then Eliphaz answered him. Then Job res responded to his friend. And then Bildad had his speech, and Job responded. This is Zophar's first speech. Let's look at that for just a minute. In Job chapter 11, verse 1, Then Zophar the Naamathite replied, these are, the, uh, are, are all these words going to go unanswered? Is this talker to be vindicated? Will your idle talk reduce others to silence? Will no one rebuke you when you mock? You say to God, my beliefs are flawless, and I'm pure in your sight. Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sin. Now, I know that we, uh, we talk about how God has moved our sins far from us as the east is from the west and thrown our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. That is not what so far means right here. God has even forgotten some of your sin. That means you have so many sins. That God, even God has forgotten some of them. He, he has a list, but he can't keep up with how many sins are against you. I used to tell a joke. I used this a lot at young people banquets years ago when I did that circuit. And I would tell a, tell a joke on one of the young people there that I might know. I'm going to use Terry this morning. Tell you this joke. I dreamed that this was in the future and I was in, I just arrived in heaven. And of course this is a facetious joke, it's not anything to do with reality. So, But there was the angel Gabriel there and he said, well, well you know, you, Jesus died for you, you're going to heaven, but it, it's really important for you to have a good perspective to realize that you sinned and when you were on the earth. And, and he says, uh, over here is a, is a ladder, go up that ladder, climb that ladder to the clouds. And at the top of those clouds, there's a huge, big, long blackboard up there. And he said, here, I'm going to give you, he gave me a cigar box full of chalk. Open the lid, it's chalk. Two pieces of chalk. He said, I want you to take this box of chalk and climb up that ladder. And when you get up to the top of that blackboard, I want you to write down all the sins of your life that you can remember. 
It's not whether you get into heaven or not. It's just that, you know, we just want you to be grateful. So I take my box of chalk and I start climbing up and I, I've been climbing and climbing. Finally, when I put my hand up here, someone was coming down and they stepped on the hand. I looked up and it was Terry, my wife. And I said, hey, Terry, I guess you're doing the same thing that I'm doing. Where are you going? She says, I got to get another box of chalk. <laughs> That's it, Ellen. It doesn't get any funnier than that. I got to get another box of chalk. Except you have to have another box. Yeah, I, mean, you know, I haven't even started yet. You're right. Let's go on to the next slide. Y'all are beginning to meddle now. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? The measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. Let's go on. If he comes along and confines you in prison, he said, you know, you really just need to be in prison. It's not that, you know, you have lost all your children and all your wealth. Yeah, you probably really ought to just be in prison. God puts you in prison and convenes a court. Who can oppose him? Surely he recognizes deceivers. And when he sees evil, does he not take note? But the witless can no more become wise than a wild donkey's coat can be born human. Are you calling me a donkey? Well, let's just go on. Verse 13. Yet if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then free of fault you will lift up your face and you'll stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your trouble and recalling it only as waters gone by. Well, you know why we would say that, don't you? It's water under the bridge. That's right. Life will be brighter than noonday and darkness will become like morning. He said, all you got to do is, is confess all of your sin. Just climb up the ladder, write down all of your sin. Let's look at the last few verses. You will be secure you, because there is hope. You will look about you and take your rest in safety. You will lie down with no one to make you afraid. And many will court your favor. But the eyes of the wicked will fail and escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying gasp. Now let me show you something around. Let me tell you, as I look through this, I remember the first time I began to work through this and I began to say, you know, he really doesn't say anything different than Eliphaz said. He actually quotes some of Eliphaz's words, or says his thoughts. And he, even some of the things that Bildad said, that, that there's really, you know, you're a sinner, God's greater than you are, and you're not all that great, and God's just punishing you for what... And I said, you know what? There's really not any content here. There's not anything different. You just need to get right with God. That's what's wrong with you. That's why you're having all this trouble. And I thought, well, why? Zophar is really just kind of echoing what they have already said. He's... He's been listening and he's been taking pieces and, or maybe he hasn't been listening and he's just put pieces and parts together that are similar to theirs or there he doesn't add anything to the conversation and then something hit me and I did several times what I just did I read it out loud you know what the difference is Zophar's angry he's mad at Job I thought, man, I can feel the venom now. I can, he's really not saying anything different, but if I read it, just read it in my own words, here is someone, he's furious at Job. And you know what? This didn't begin with Job's calamity. This man, I believe, had been jealous of Job for a long time. He had been envious of Job and had kept it hidden. He had despised Job secretly and he didn't he couldn't wonder we get the impression that Zophar is also a wealthy person but he never matched all the glory and all the wondrous things that were a part of Job's life and Job was clearly blessed of God now Job 
wasn't blessed of God because he'd earned it or deserved it or because he was a better person than his friends. But let me tell you what. Last Sunday, as I kind of sat back and watched our family have a meal together and celebrate our family and our additions to our family and all the goodness of God, I thought, I've been blessed. God's been so good to me. And it never would occur to me that someone on the outside, someone who was not a part of our family, or someone who was not one of our friends, or someone that just maybe popped in and casually saw us, might even feel anger or bitterness or resentment because of God's grace in our lives that we don't deserve. And they could very clearly see, no, they don't. They didn't earn that. They don't deserve all that blessedness. But I, I find sometimes that, that I have to deal with anger, too. Sometimes I have felt that it's a part of me being a preacher or a pastor to be angry with people. To make a determination if peace people measure up or if they're fulfilling their obligations, if they're meeting their Christian responsibilities. And sometimes as a pastor, when I've looked out and I've found myself weighing people or judging people and trying to determine, is this person helping or hurting the, the cause of Christ? And sometimes I've found myself becoming angry with people. I, I sometimes, as a parent, I've become angry with my children. who have been angry with my wife. I get angry at myself. Let me show you something. Now, let's go a little bit further. That is all of Zophar, uh, uh, his speech. But the only thing different I see is that he seems to be emotionally on fire. He seems to be filled with venom and poison. And he is the only one, actually, that maybe the new thing that he does say is that, you know, it's bad for you, Joe, and you've had a rough time, but you know what? You really ought to be in prison. Let's go on. Here are some words from Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. It's from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 22. And this is from the King James Version. Let me read it to you. This is verse 22. Jesus says, But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Now, he, the previous verse probably should have put that up as well. It says, you have heard it said in old time, or up from the scriptures, thou shalt not kill. He says, don't kill anybody. He says, let me tell you what. Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rakab, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, thou fool, or you're a fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Angry. There's something, however, about this verse. And what I did is I just copied and pasted this just right out of the Bible to this screen. Do you see something unusual about the printing or the text, the font in this verse? Look right there. Part of it's italicized. Without a cause is in italics. Now, you, if, if you read the, from the King James Version of the Bible, as you read through it, you will find sometimes you will see words and they, they're, they're kind of a wispy font and it's leaning a little bit to the right. Without a cause, it's not in a block text, but it's in italics. It's leaned a little bit. It's a little bit thinner in line. Without a cause. You know what that means? That's, when they put words in italics, that's the translator's way of saying this was not in the Greek manuscript, but we thought it ought to be. <laughs> there are thousands of instances in the King James Version where the King James translators added words because they, they thought it helped make more sense. Let's look at the New American Standard Bible. Look at the next slide there, Andy. This is from the NASB. Most of the well, the Greek manuscripts just say this. 
This is a more modern translation, and it went back, there are, there are over 5,000 different manuscripts that we have today possession of the Greek New Testament. Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to, to his brother, you good for nothing, raka, you shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell without a cause. You see, some scribe somewhere says, well, you know, he probably doesn't mean just angry. He means, you know, sometimes you can be angry and have a good reason for being angry, a cause. But that's not what Jesus said. Let me show you why. Let's look at the next verse. This is from the book of James, chapter 19, chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Listen, I'll tell you in my life, when I am in a bad mood, when I am negative, or when I am angry or bitter, I am less like Christ at that moment in my life than at any other time. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When I get angry, James says, getting angry doesn't make you a better Christian. It doesn't help you get the job done for God. As a matter of fact, more often than not, when you and I get angry, James says, we don't do the right thing. We're not in the right. We're not in the right. I've learned to look at myself more often than not. When I let my temper go and I become angry, I am less and less like Jesus. Let's go on. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, the writer John says, We know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. If you asked Zophar, if you said, Oh man, if you, you know, he just finished his first speech. He's got one more in chapter 11. We're not going to look at every chapter in the book of Job. We're just, the next thing we'll look at is a speech of a young man that just shows up out of nowhere and an eloquent we're going to jump on it even further. We're not going to look at every verse of Job. 42 chapters. We've kind of gotten the gist almost so far. Zophar, I just heard your speech. Don't you love your friend Job? Do you know what Zophar would probably say? Oh, I do love Job. He's my friend. He's my brother. You know what I would have to say? It doesn't sound like it. Doesn't look like it. Doesn't seem like it. Doesn't seem like you love him. Doesn't sound like the kinds of things that someone who loves somebody. You, know, you can say you love somebody. Oh yeah, I love them. I love them in Jesus. But our words and our actions and the, the, our temperament will often give us away. Let's look at the next slide. Remember this is what Jesus said. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have one, one for another. So far, if you were a disciple of Jesus, people would know it by how right you are. Or how correct you are. Or how well you've sized up a person's life or his life situation. They wouldn't say, oh, obviously he's tuned into God. Obviously, he's connected to God because he's got such a great grasp of right and wrong. He can look at people and tell the righteous from the unrighteous. He has a keen insight. He has a spiritual gift of discernment. and He can look into the hearts of men and women and children and he can see the light of the darkness in their life. No, that is not how Jesus said people would be able to look at us and say, ah, oh, he must be a follower of Jesus. Maybe we carry around a big Bible. Well, the bigger the Bible, 
the closer to God, right? Well, that's a big Bible. People are not going to be able to figure out that you're a disciple of Jesus by how big the Bible is, that you, or what version it is. Some people say, well, it has to be a certain version. Only those are actually followers of God. Or maybe you pray. Maybe you talk about Jesus all the time. Maybe it is a part of your daily conversation. But even if you mention Jesus in every other word, every other sentence of your conversation, Jesus says that is not how they're going to come to the conclusion or figure out the truth. They said they're going to see how much you love each other. And if they hear you thinking out loud the way Zophar did, let's go on. Let me show you something. This is what Paul says. He says, when you follow your own wrong inclinations, your lives will produce these evil results. Impure thoughts, eagerness for pleasure, idolatry, superstition, hatred and fighting, jealousy and anger, constant effort to get the best for yourself, complaints and criticisms, the feeling that everyone else is wrong except you, envy. He says, let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Paul called these the works of the flesh. So when you see somebody like that, you're looking at somebody like Zophar. Let's look at what he does recommend. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, he says, this is what the Spirit produces in our life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. In other words, giving you a long piece of rope, giving you lots of slack, letting things ride, letting things go, saying, okay, don't worry about it. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. He says, there's no law against those things. You see the great difference between what the Spirit of God produces and what our human flesh produces? Anger is one of those things that shows us when we, we may call it righteous indignation. But the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. What makes you mad today? What makes you angry? Yes, there are some things in the world that deserve our disapproval. But it is never going to be people. It's never going to be people. Especially our friends. Our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray for this moment. Father, I want to thank you for forgiving me. And I didn't have to write down all my sins, but they were all nailed to the cross. My cross. By you. Since I have been forgiven so much, how can I be anything but forgiving? and long-suffering to others. Help me to get all the anger and the resentment and the bitterness out of my heart and life. I know that you know all things. And you not only know my brother and sister in Christ and their life, you know me. Lord, I know that there is always a beam or two in my eye. And I do know that I have spent many hours in my life <coughs> hoping to remove the splinters from the eyes of others. Help me to see myself. Give me humility. If there is anyone here today and they're just angry and bitter and they have hard, harsh feelings, I pray that you forgive them and deliver them and give them a spirit of your spirit. And I ask these things in your name. Amen. Daddy, would you come and lead us in a hymn of decision? Now, during this time, I want you to let God, you've been very kind to listen to me as I speak today, but now is the most important. That's when God speaks, and we respond to Him. If, you, if He's touched your heart in any way, please respond to Him. You don't have to do anything religious. Just listen to His voice and respond directly to Him. While you're sitting there in the privacy of your own heart, listen to the voice of God. Do what God tells you to do.